page 252, Friday, December 1st. It's nearly midnight on Friday. It's been a night to remember. I just got off the phone with Joey. He called to find out if I'm all right. I think I am. In fact, I think I'm more than all right. Joey said that everybody at his party was asking about me. I guess that would include Carrie, the date I never had. I told Joey everything that I knew about tonight, and he told me what he knew. Between us, I think we managed to piece together what happened at the Lake Windsor High School gym. Let me start at the beginning. I took another bogus sick day today. Mom didn't care. She seems to be having problems of her own. She spent a couple of hours on the phone this morning, holding a yellow legal pad in her lap. I went walking through and I heard her talking to someone at the sheriff's department. Anyway, both mom and I managed to do what dad asked, to be ready at six o'clock to go to the senior awards night. I wore black pants that were too short for me and a white shirt that was too tight. Mom commented, that's it, Paul. We have to get you some new clothes this weekend, definitely. The seniors had to be at the gym at 6.30 so they could learn where they were supposed to stand and what they were supposed to do. To dad, this meant that we had to arrive at 6.30 too, even though Eric was riding with Arthur Bauer. So there we were, standing outside the south entrance to the gym an hour beforehand. Some members of the football team were still carrying risers in and setting them up on the hardwood floor. The principal, Mr. Bridges, was pacing nervously and gesturing to Coach Warner. He finally settled down when a pickup truck arrived towing a boat trailer. It wasn't hauling a boat, though. It was hauling a tree, the laurel oak that would be planted in Mike Costello's name. The tree was a lot bigger than I had expected. It was about 15 feet tall, and it was growing in an enormous plastic tub full of black dirt that was almost as wide as the trailer. The driver of the truck swung around and backed up toward the gym door, following Mr. Bridges' hand signals. Mr. Bridges called out to the coach, All right, now what do we do? How do we get it from here to the basketball court? Coach Warner disappeared inside and came back with four of his biggest seniors, including Brian Baylor. They spread out around the trailer and started talking about how to move it. Mr. Bridges opened the double doors for them. As soon as he did, I could see Joey and his parents standing inside. On the count of three, Brian Baylor and the other guys hefted the trailer up and off to off of the truck hitch. They started walking the trailer into the gym like a huge wheelbarrow. Everything went fine until they got to the spot where they were supposed to set it down. When Brian Baylor let his end all the way down, the big tub tipped toward him. The tree branches crashed down on his head, and a huge pile of black dirt came pouring onto the gym floor. Coach Warner ducked into his office beneath the bleachers and came out with a board and a pair of cinder blocks. Brian hefted up the trailer again, and the coach slid the board and the blocks underneath it, straightening out the tub. Mr. Bridges clapped his hands together and called out, All right! Now let's get this dirt cleaned up. Brian Baylor and the other football guys drifted away. They had no intention of touching that dirt. I walked over and started to scoop some back into the tub. Joey joins me right away. In a few minutes, we had it all cleaned up. Joey said, Fish, are you being a hero again? I looked at him, but I couldn't tell if he was being serious or sarcastic. Then he took one of his black smudged hands and made like he was going to press it onto my white shirt. I backed off and we both laughed. Mr. Costello led us into Coach Warner's office, where we used the bathroom sink to wash up. The only other thing that Joey said was, Do you need a ride to my house tonight, you and Carrie? I said, yeah. When we came out from under the bleachers, there was a lot more activity in the gym. Mom and Dad had staked out seats just above us, about six rows up and on the aisle. Mom leaned over and said to me, Paul, get a program from that girl. I looked over and saw a student council girl in a blazer standing on the basketball court right next to the tree. She was holding a pile of programs. Joey and I went up to her. She turned to him and said, you're Mike's brother, aren't you? He said, yeah. She smiled and told him, Mike was a really good guy. Joey just nodded. Then he pointed at me and said, and this is Eric's brother. The girl showed some mild interest. Eric Fisher? I shuffled uncomfortably. She handed me a program and added, Mr. Generosity? I must have looked really confused. She laughed, said, he sure is a great kicker, and turned to greet some new arrivals. Mr. and Mrs. Costello started gesturing to Joey to come. They had joined Mr. Donnelly in a low riser near center court. I said to him, I'll catch you later, and climbed up the steps to sit with mom and dad. 
I could see that the low riser was going to be the focal point of the ceremonies. There were six chairs on it, a table covered with trophies, and a microphone stand. Behind it were three rows of risers. Each one was six inches taller than the one before it. All of the bleacher sections on our side of the gym had been pulled out, and they were filling up quickly. On the far side of the gym, only the center sections on both sides of the exit had been pulled out. The marching band, the Seagirls, and the rest of the football team, the guys who weren't seniors, were sitting there. I caught sight of Carrie and Kara. They were in the top row, about five sections to the right of us, near the east entrance. They were looking right at me. They smiled and waved, and I waved back. I saw a few other kids from Lake Windsor Middle School come in, Joey's friends. They all climbed up to that same section. That Adam kid was with them, but he didn't sit next to Carrie. A high-pitched wail of feedback snapped my attention back to the front riser. Mr. Bridges was standing at the microphone, getting ready to begin. He said, if everyone will take their places, we can get started. Everything was arranged in descending steps. Across from us, against the far wall, the blue uniforms of the band members filled two sections from top to bottom. Then the white and blue robes of the chorus singers filled three risers from high to low. On the front riser were Coach Warner, Mr. Bridges, Mr. Donnelly, and the Costellos. To their right, or my left, was a laurel oak tree. And in the space in between, at floor, floor level, were the other honored guests of the evening, the senior football players. The leader of the chorus raised her hand and we all got quiet. The chorus and band performed a song called Try to Remember. After the song, Mr. Donnelly took over the microphone. He talked about sportsmanship and about how Mike Costello was a role model. He read some lines from a poem called To an Athlete Dying Young. Mr. Donnelly then called on the president of the student council, a tall guy in a blazer, to come up and read a statement about the laurel oak tree. The statement was a lot longer than it needed to be. He read a long list of names of people who helped make this possible. I found my attention drifting back to the right, about five rows up. But when I looked over there, my eyes never got past the east entrance. I bent forward and heard myself whisper, oh my god. There they stood, Tino and Victor. It was like a mirage. It was impossible. They couldn't be there. And yet they were. They were standing together on the sidelines, staring straight ahead, hard-eyed, totally focused like the wrath of God. They continued to stare at the front, and I continued to stare at them, as the student council guy finished and Mr. Donnelly returned to the microphone. He began to introduce the senior football players, reading from the program listing Brett Andrews, Arthur Bauer, Brian Baylor. I looked back at Mr. Donnelly. He was relaxed, smiling, totally unaware of any problem. As he read each player's names, the player walked out and stood facing us, in front of the people on the riser. Terry Donnelly, John Drew, Eric Fisher, I looked back at Tino and Victor, and my blood turned cold. I became terrified. What had they come here to do? I didn't have to wait to find out. Tino took off at a brisk walk down the sideline. Victor, right behind him. They silently closed in on the front riser as Mr. Donnelly continued to read the names. But then, suddenly, Mr. Donnelly became aware of their presence. He stopped reading, looked up at the two of them marching forward, and smiled. You could almost see the wheels turning in his head. Something like, had he forgotten to introduce these youngsters so they could come up and read the poem they had written? He soon had his answer. Mr. Donnelly and the rest of us watched in absolute silence as Tino crossed the hardwood floor and walked directly up to Eric. Eric never saw it coming. Tino brought his right leg up and around in a vicious karate kick that doubled Eric over and filled the gym with a sickening huh sound from his emptying lungs. Then Tino stepped back, measured the distance, and brought his knee up into Eric's face. A sharp sound like the snapping of a twig echoed in the gym. Then Tino, his voice trembling with rage and choked with tears, shouted, that's for Louise Cruz. I take care of his light work. I could sense Dad standing up next to me, but that's all he did. He stood up and stared at Tino. Everyone on the floor, on the risers, and in the stands seemed frozen in place. The first person to move was Arthur Bauer. He moved toward Eric, I suppose to protect him from further damage, but he never got there. Victor took off at a full sprint. 
Arthur turned just as Victor's head drove into his midsection. Arthur went flying backward into Brian Baylor, who pushed him away. Suddenly, all of the people in the stands were released, and they went crazy, jumping up and screaming and yelling. Victor jumped on Arthur and started pummeling him furiously, landing roundhouse blows to his head so fast that his arms were a blur, like the nylon strings on a weed whacker. Coach Warner bellowed above the rest of the voices, grab them, grab them. Some of the players obeyed. They jumped Victor from behind and pulled him off of Arthur Bauer. Coach Warner himself grabbed Tino, who was still standing over Eric's prostrate body. But Victor could not be held. One of his captors slipped and fell on the blood that had spilled out of Eric's nose. Victor broke free and ran. The seniors chased him and trapped him like a snarling wolf up against the emergency exit door. They charged at him, hit him, and drove him into the red bar that says, Alarm will sound. And that's exactly what happened. The alarm went off. The door flew open. Victor slipped their grasp and was off, running into the night. Mr. Bridges took the microphone and started pleading for order, but Coach Warner was screaming over him, screaming at the players who'd let Victor get away. He twisted Tino's arm into a hammerlock and started walking him quickly toward the sideline, toward it all toward his office, toward me. All I remember next is mom shouting, Paul, as I took off flying through the air. I landed hard on Coach Warner's back and held on tight, riding his neck and shoulders. He lurched to one side, losing his grip on Tino. I felt one huge hand come around and grab my hair, yanking me forward right over his head. I bounced off the floor just as Tino hit the exit door. He too was gone into the night. I got pulled to my feet by a couple of football players who dragged me under the bleachers and into the coach's office. I thought they were going to beat me up, but then dad burst into the room along with Coach Warner. I was relieved for about two seconds, and then dad himself was in my face, grabbing me my, by my shirt and screaming, I'd kill you for that. Are you crazy? Coach Warner seemed a little more in control. He pointed a big finger at me and demanded to know, who are they? I stared him down, which made dad even matter. He screamed, you heard the man, who are they? I stared dad down too. He turned to Coach Warner and reported, my wife thinks they're from his soccer team, the Tangerine Middle School soccer team. The coach shook his head slowly and asked dad the big question, the question that everybody in that gym had to be asking, why? Dad worked his jaw muscles at a complete loss for words. At the same time, he loosened his grip on my shirt. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that the coach had an emergency exit door of his own. I didn't hesitate. I hit that red bar at full speed and never looked back. I sprinted across the parking lot, around the football stadium, and out onto Route 89. I ran for my life at full speed, like I was sprinting down the sideline of an endless soccer field. I kept that pace up all the way to Lake Windsor Downs. I veered off onto the perimeter road and stumbled along over the packed dirt until I find my, found myself at the wall behind our house. Then I stopped still, clutching my side, gasping for air, doubled over in pain. When I was able to, I looked up at the wall. The pain had been cleaned off, but the words were still faintly visible in the moonlight. Seagulls suck. I stood studying that wall for many minutes. Then I felt headlights on me, too high up to be a car's headlights. I turned and watched the Land Cruiser pulling up slowly and unevenly in the rutted dirt. Eric and Arthur stayed inside for a minute, invisible behind the tinted glass. Then a bolt of light shot into my eyes, snapping my head back. It was the Land Cruiser's center spotlight, huge, bright, and powerful like a setting sun. Eric and Arthur opened their doors and got out, leaving the motor running and the headlights on. They stepped around in front so that the lights were on me while they remained in shadow. Still, I could see that their faces were swollen and bloody, and I could see that Eric was holding a metal baseball bat in one hand. I understood that I was supposed to be terrified by the spectacle, these two demonic creatures on this dark, lonely road, but for once in my life, I wasn't. I stepped forward and faced them, just as I had seen Louise do. I held my hands out, as he had done, and said, 
I'm not afraid of you, Eric. Come on. Eric stood in his pose, not moving. But Arthur did move. He produced the blackjack and began to tap it into his hand. I thought to myself, can you really be that stupid? Can you really still be carrying around the murder weapon? When they finally spoke, it wasn't terrifying. It was lame. They started in on the same routine as always. Eric made his remarks and Arthur repeated them as if nothing in their pathetic lives had changed. As if they had not just been beaten up by a pair of 7th graders in front of the entire football team and 500 other people. Eric posed and talked and then Arthur repeated, You're going to pay for what happened tonight. Oh yeah, you're going to pay. You're going to wish tonight had never happened. Oh yeah. I couldn't stand it. I took another step forward and challenged him. Come on, Eric. Let's see if you can do any better with me than you did with Tino. Eric stopped, his rhythm broken. I could see that his nose was pushed over to one side. He tried to ignore my interruption. He poked the bat at me. We'll decide what's going to happen to you. We'll decide. Maybe you'll be in the right place, but maybe it'll be the wrong time. Oh, yeah, it'll be the wrong time. And then it'll happen. I took another step forward. Now I could see swelling around Arthur's eyes. I said, I've already been in the right place at the wrong time, you lowlife creeps, you pathetic losers. I was under the bleachers on Tuesday afternoon. I raised my finger like it was loaded and I pointed it at Arthur. I saw you kill Louise Cruz. Arthur's swollen eyes widened and he took a step backward. Eric shot a quick look at him. Then he turned back to me. Who's going to believe you, you blind little geek? You're blind. You can't see ten feet in front of you. Nobody's going to listen to you. Eric stared at me with growing fury, with growing hatred, moving the bat in a tight circle. I could see that his eyes, too, were starting to swell closed. I ignored him. I continued to speak to Arthur. And I'm not the only one who saw it. Eric snapped. He's lying. But Arthur had heard enough. He said, come on, let's get out of here. Eric shouted, he's lying, he's lying, he's lying, until he completely lost control. He started smashing the bat into the mud ruts in front of him, grunting with rage at every blow. Then he turned and unleashed a furious shot at the right headlight of the Land Cruiser. The glass exploded, sparks flew, and the light sputtered out. Arthur's voice was trembling, pleading, come on, come on, let's get out of here. Eric was still in his rage. He was talking to Arthur Bauer, but he was staring at me when he roared, Shut up, Castor. Then, deep breath by deep breath, the rage started to recede. Eric backed up, step by step. He turned and threw the bat into the land cruiser. He got in, and Arthur got in, and they drove quickly away. They drove away, leaving that name, Castor hanging in the air, like some horrible apparition, like the key to a lock, like the solution to an unsolved crime. I turned my head slowly back toward the wall, and I remembered something from long ago. A silver gray wall. It surrounded a development called Silver Meadows, where we lived when I was four and five years old. I remembered Castor. Vincent Castor. He was Eric's goon back then. He followed Eric around and did whatever he was told. I remembered spray paint on that wall. Eric and Vincent Castor had found a can of white spray paint, and they had painted something on that gray wall. I don't even know what it was. I never did. I just knew that Eric and Vincent Castor had done it. All the kids in the development knew that, but I never told anybody about it. I remember coming out to play in the morning and not being able to find any of my friends. Where were they? Did they know something? Did they know what was going to happen to me? I remembered walking into our garage and hearing Eric's voice, cold and menacing. He said, you're going to have to pay for what you did. I said, what? I didn't do anything. You're going to have to pay for telling on Castor. You told who spray painted on that wall, and Castor got into trouble. Castor doesn't like getting into trouble. I turned around and saw Vincent Castor. He was holding a can of spray paint. Then I felt Eric grab me from behind, easily pinning both of my arms with just one of his. I could hear my voice crying, I didn't tell. I didn't tell. And I remembered Eric's fingers prying my eyelids open while Vincent Castor sprayed white paint into them.
They left me screaming and rolling around on the floor of the garage. Mom came out and tried to drag me over to the hose to rinse out my eyes, but I fought like a wildcat. She managed to push me into the back seat of the car and drive me to the hospital. Somewhere around that time, so they say, there was an eclipse of the sun. I didn't remember that, but I remembered all the rest. I stood for a little while longer until I was sure there was nothing else to remember. I climbed over the wall, hopped down, and crossed the yard to the back door. Mom and Dad were sitting on stools at the breakfast nook, looking at a yellow legal pad when I walked in. They were ready to jump on me, no doubt about it, but I jumped first. I said to Mom, Do you remember Vincent Castor from Silver Meadows? Mom and Dad looked at each other. There was no question about it. They remembered. Do you remember him, Mom? Dad? He was the Arthur Bauer of his day. Mom turned deathly pale. She said, What's this all about, Paul? Dad tried to regain control. Listen, there are questions that need to be answered about tonight. I exploded. No, no, sir. I yanked off my Coke bottle glasses and shook them at him in rage. There are questions that need to be answered about these. Am I such a stupid idiot fool that I stared at a solar eclipse for an hour and blinded myself? Is that who I am? Am I that idiot? They didn't answer. They didn't look at me. They didn't even seem to be breathing. Dad was looking down at the yellow legal pad when he said, You are five years old, Paul. There's only so much you could understand. All that you could understand was that something bad had happened. Mom spoke with her eyes closed as if she weren't really there, as if she were coming in over the radio. I was so terrified that you would be blind. But the news wasn't all bad. They told me that you would not be blind. They told me that your eyes would heal, slowly. Her eyes opened, but her voice started to fade away. They told me that you might lose your peripheral vision, or you might not, but you would not be blind. That was the good news. Then Mom started to cry. With her face still frozen like a statue, she started to cry. I lowered my voice and said to her, Let me ask you one thing, Mom. When you got home from the hospital that day, did you see the white paint on Eric's hands? She didn't hesitate. Yes. Did you know what happened? Yes. No one spoke for a couple of minutes. Dad continued to examine the legal pad in front of him. Then he said, The doctors told us that you might never remember, and we figured that that was the best way to handle the situation. He shook his head sadly. We wanted to find a way to keep you from always hating your brother. I answered, So you figured it would be better if I just hated myself. That did it. Dad was finished. He broke down. It was frightening to see. He didn't cry like a statue. He cried like a baby. After a minute, I left them sitting there, snuffling and feeling sorry for themselves, and I came upstairs. That brings me up to Joey's phone call, asking me if I'm all right. I am all right. I'm more than all right. Finally.